Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, if you would please, this morning. We did an intro to this second letter that Paul wrote to this church in Thessalonia. And now we will look at his first chapter of that letter. Have you ever written a letter or a note or maybe sent an email or a text and realized that uh, the person that you sent it to was confused about what you meant? And so you had to write another note or you had to send another text? Well, That's what happened, and that's the purpose of this second letter that Paul sent to the Thessalonians. It was actually sent just after a few months that he had uh, sent the first letter. And it was sent to clarify some points that the people were confused about. Are you confused about things that you read in the Bible at times? Well, so were the original recipients, and that's what 2 Thessalonians seeks to remedy. Originally, Paul and Timothy, uh, actually Paul sent Timothy, I should say, from the city of Corinth to Thessalonia in order to bring back a report of how this new local church was doing in that sinful city. And when Timothy returned, he had a good report that despite the harsh persecution that the church had already begun to suffer, these people, these brand new baby Christians, were spiritually prospering. And as a result, it brought rejoicing, of course, to Paul and Silas and Timothy's heart. But they got confused about the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ. Now, remember, there's a difference between the second coming and the rapture. Remember that? By the way, do you have that chart? I just wondered. It doesn't have to be up now, but I just want to be sure that you have it. Okay, good. Because eventually we'll get to that chart. <clears throat> but what I wanted to uh, to mention is that Paul writes this letter to eliminate the confusion and and as well to encourage a group of believers that are newly saved that are just suffering persecution. And he reminds them of several things. Look at verses 1 and 2. Two times here, he reminds them that God is their Abba, that he is their father. And as a father, he'll protect them. He will bring security to them because he is the source of the greatest need of the human heart in a time of trial. God is the is the one through which our all the spiritual resources that our hearts need comes from. Look at uh, what he says in verse two: "Grace and peace be unto you." Grace, we know what that is. That's God's strength. And peace, that's wholeness. And it is God's uh, grace that brings us peace in our hearts. And so he's encouraging these people. And he begins to encourage them by offering genuine praise to them. He praises them for whether he's proud of them. He's proud of these new believers. And in verses three and four, He begins by really praising them for how they have responded to their persecution and their circumstances. Before we look at that, let's pause a moment and pray again, shall we? Our Father, we thank you this morning that we can depend upon you. We thank you, Lord, that the words that your apostle sent to this early church still speaks to us today, still is, it's a timeless message. It still has uh, relevance and power. And that's what we want you to do today through this look into this letter, that you would make it relevant to our own lives, our own situations. And Lord, 
that you would encourage our hearts, just as Paul encouraged the hearts of these people, that we would understand some things about you and how you work that would cause us just to actually rejoice even in our trial. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus, he makes all the difference in our daily life. We are what we are by him and by your grace. And for that, we give thanks and pray for a special anointing to both understand and to apply your word in our lives. In Jesus' name, that is for his sake, we ask it. Amen. So look at how he begins in verse three. He says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren. Bound? You know what that word bound refers to? It refers to a debt. And what Paul is saying to them, I owe you a debt. I have to pay. I feel like I owe you a debt of thanks for the work that you have cooperated with God and what he has done in you. And I'm going to enthusiastically pay that debt. I am bound, he says, we are bound to thank God always for you. And by the way, anything that is praiseworthy in our life, we need to thank God for. It's his work in us and through us. He's not praising these people because they're so great, but because God has done a work and they have submitted to what God has wanted to do in them and through them. And so he's thankful for that. Notice then specifically what he praises this church for. Again, in verse three, he says, your faith groweth exceedingly. The first thing that he is praising them for, he is thankful to God that what is happening in this church is that their faith is growing. They have a growing faith. In fact, the term there is growing exceedingly. That is only used here in the entire New Testament in the original language. It's a very strong verb, groweth exceedingly or growing exceedingly. It's a picture of a healthy plant. <laughs> you know, we have this three steps from the sidewalk up to our... Uh, our yard in front of our house and right alongside of those three steps a little bit ago i dug maybe a three foot by a two foot wide uh area of dirt on either side of those steps and i lined it with like scalloped um uh, pavers and then i planted uh, some flowers in there and I don't know, I guess it was the salt when we shoveled in the wintertime. The next, uh, uh, it, they were supposed to come up on their own. They died. And it's just a, a, a place where there was uh, mulch and, and no flowers. So I decided to plant something else there. And I got something called, I guess it's creeping ivy, creeping myrtle. Okay. And uh, I planted it there. And uh, we didn't have hardly any snow this year, so there wasn't a lot of salt. There wasn't a lot of shoveling. And boy, I look at it now, and despite the cold and the hot weather that we've had already uh, this spring, it's really taking hold. It looks like a healthy plant. The picture here groweth exceedingly regarding their faith is that they had become more and more God-dependent. That's what faith is. It's God dependence, but they've been consistent and uh, it, their faith has uh, grown extensively as they, though they're young, are beginning to mature. It's really true that the, the, the more that you know and the more that you have experience with God, the more you will trust him. The more you know God, the more experience that you have with him, the more you will be able to trust him. An easy life is a shallow life. 
these people, their faith was growing exceedingly because they didn't have any other recourse but to trust God. They couldn't turn to anyone else to encourage them and to help them. And so as a result, their faith was strengthened. You know, faith is like a muscle. When I was a lot younger, I used to lift weights on a regular basis to try to not only exercise, but to build muscle in my body. And uh, perhaps I should start that again, because I'm noticing that a lot of my muscle is, to, is going away at this stage in my life. But faith is like a muscle. It has to be exercised. The more that you are thrown into depending upon God, the stronger your faith will become. Your faith will increase. It will grow stronger. It's not how much faith you have. It's how strong your faith is. And the strength of your faith is when it is rooted in the Lord. Their faith was growing exceedingly, and that was praiseworthy. Paul takes time to note that. Look at verse 3 again. And the charity, or that word charity, is translated love in many places. For God so loved the world, same word, translated charity here. So it is God's love. It's God's love in and through a human being. Your charity, your love, your God-like love of every one of you, all toward each other, aboundeth. So he's thankful to God, praising these people, not only for their growing faith, but also for their expanding love. Their love is expanding. It is abounding, he says in that verse. It's overspreading as a flood covers everything in its path. That creeping myrtle, that stuff, it does creep. It's creeping out over the boundaries that I planted it in. It's creeping out over uh, the edges of those uh, pavers that I put up, and it's going over into the grass. It's expanding. That's a picture, not only of a healthy plant, but an expanding, uh, a, a plant that is expanding, and it's a picture of their expanding love. Their faith, their faith that was growing exceedingly caused their love to expand and to abound as well. And notice who the love is directed to, toward each other, toward each other. You know, this kind of love, this abounding love, is a love that doesn't discriminate. It embraces all the brothers and sisters. That's the kind of love that God puts in the heart of his people. That's what Paul's thankful and praising them for, that their love is not just reaching out to a certain few, to their clique, to their little group, but is embracing the entire congregation. They are embracing all. They have love toward all. That's expanding love that he's thanking them for and praising, uh, thanking God and praising them for. But look at verse four. Here's a third thing that he gives praise to these people for. Not only their growing faith and their expanding love, but in verse four, he says, we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God. In other words, we're boasting. Uh, in the right sense, we're so proud of you that we're telling other churches of what God has done in your lives in such a short period of time. You, just baby Christians, you're really an example to other churches that have existed for a long time, more uh, a, a, a much longer time than you have existed. And he says, here's what I praise God for, that your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations, that ye endure. The word patience is the word that means endurance. That ye endure, he says, 
So he praises them for growing faith, for expanding love, but also continuing perseverance. You know what it means to persevere? It means not to quit. It means not to give up. That's something that uh, every person needs, but especially Christians. They need Holy Spirit perseverance, the ability to not give up, to not quit. And here's these people suffering persecution. They're being attacked for being Christians. Notice how he puts it here. You have endured, you have endurance or patience in all your persecutions. That is attacks that people bring upon you for being a believer. But also, he says, and tribulations. And that is a much broader term. And that refers to any trial, not just being persecuted or attacked because you're a believer, but any trial or any affliction that you might have, he says, you have continuing perseverance. And I thank God for that. And I praise uh, him for what is done in you. The word patience there in that uh, fourth verse literally means this. It, to re, it means to remain under something, to remain under something, to not react and run away from it, whatever the situation might be, but to be enabled to persevere because you view that God is in your circumstances and he wants through your circumstances to reveal his glorious power. And so you look to him and you depend upon him. And as a result, you're able to have a continuing perseverance. See how he says uh, that in that fourth verse. You remain under in your persecutions, in your tribulations, you persevere, you endure. So happens that just on Friday, it marked the one year anniversary of the home going of uh, the musician and composer Ron Hamilton, the majesty hymnal that we sing from all the time uh, is a result of this man's ministry. And his wife wrote a post. Uh, and I wanted just to share a few lines because I thought it was uh, it was very pertinent to what we're saying here. I closed this day, April 19th, that was Friday, with Ron's own words that have meant so much to me and others. These words serve as a comfort when our earthly challenges are so weighty, we think we might drown. Well, these words give a fainting heart hope, a doubting mind courage, and a life lived serving Jesus reassurance. Here's the words. And by the way, it's in our hymnal, the words and the song. God never moves without purpose or plan when trying his servant or molding a man. Give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seems long. In darkness, he giveth a song. I could not see through the shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I bowed to the will of the master that day. Then peace came and tears fled away. Now I can see testing comes from above. God strengthens his children and purges in love. My father knows best and I trust in his care. Through purging more fruit I will bear. Oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. You know when Ron Hamilton wrote that? He got the inspiration for that song when he was sitting in a hospital bed, having uh, uh, awakened from surgery, realizing that his eye had been removed because of cancer. And he was just swamped with all of these get well cards. And he began looking at the get well cards and the messages in them and got the words for that song 
after that time. Oh, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And this is what Paul is doing. He's rejoicing in the Lord, thanking him for what he has already and is accomplishing in the lives of this young baby church in Thessalonia. So he praises them. But then in verses 5 to 10, he encourages them. He encourages them not only by praising them, but also by reminding them of promises. And this is something that we always need to be reminded of, the promises of God. And there are several that uh, he reminds them of. You know, some thought that uh, some people, and perhaps they're in Thessalonia too, some believers think that uh, difficulties really shows that God doesn't care. Uh, but actually, it's the opposite. See what he says in verse 5? He says, your persecutions are a manifest token of the righteousness of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of which you also suffer. So some there and some of us uh, at times, we think that difficulties shows that, that God's not fair. But the opposite is true. What he says in that fifth verse is that our tribulation, our trials, actually illustrate that God is just, that he is working out his plan for his people. And we tend to think that if we suffer, it shows that God doesn't care. But he says, have a proper response to your trials because really what they reveal is that God is at work in your life. Can you respond to trials that way? Can you see them from a different standpoint, like Paul says here? They are a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that God is using these to work out his plan for your life. Remember his promises, and there are three experiences involved in God's promises that he covers here in this passage. First, in, in verse 5, um, he, he says that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. You know what that's referring to? That's referring to the fact that in the future, believers are going to be rewarded. That there is a reward for there is a reward that God has reserved for his people who suffer persecution and who respond rightly to tribulation. Now, he's not saying that you earn being worthy of God's kingdom. What he's saying is that God graciously declares these believers worthy. Their endurance didn't make them worthy, but it demonstrates to God and to the world that you are worthy of his kingdom. You know, our character is really developed through our trials. Remember how Paul puts it in Romans 5? He, uh, he says that our trials develop character in us. And it is through those trials that our true character is exposed. And so he says there's reward. There's reward that comes to God's people. That's a promise from the Lord. You're counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you suffer. But there's a second thing in these verses that we ought to keep in mind. And I use the word repay. Uh, he uses the word recompense in verse 6 seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. He's saying God's going to pay back. God's going to repay those that persecute his people. He puts it this way in uh, verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to pause here a moment. When it says that God is going to recompense, when it says that God is going to repay or pay back those that persecute uh, 
his people. Vengeance is not the same thing as revenge. You and I take revenge. Vengeance is not revenge. Revenge is to personal to gratify or to pacify some personal grudge that we have. But when God takes vengeance on those that he says in, in that eighth verse, don't know God and don't obey the gospel of God, he is simply satisfying the law of God. Because when human beings violate God's law, God is bound in his holiness to demand that the penalty be paid. And the wonderful thing of it is, is that that is the whole reason Jesus came to this earth. That's the whole reason he hung on that tree. He was paying the price. He was paying the penalty of God's law that was broken for uh, by us, and he was doing it for us. And the fact of the matter is the penalty has already been paid. And yet if you obey not the gospel, if you, as he says in that eighth verse, refuse, reject the God that has paid the penalty for you, then God has no other alternative than to take vengeance and to satisfy his law that demands payment. It's got to be paid. And either you take Jesus as your payment for the broken law of God that all of us are guilty of breaking, or then you have to suffer the vengeance of God. And I want you to see, I want you to see a little bit about it here. He says, who shall be punished, verse 9, with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When will this happen? Verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Persecution is something that God will not allow to go unnoticed. God may allow it to prevail for the time, for this time. There's coming a day when God is going to deal with it. And believers, as believers, we need to learn to walk by faith every day. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And when we do so, it means that we have a future. We have a, 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 uh, a long-term eternal view in mind. And when you have a future eternal view, it gives even a persecuted or, or uh, life-suffering tribulation, it gives it meaning. Reminds me of the story of two farmers that uh, uh, they lived in close proximity to each other. And one was a believer, the other was an atheist. And one particular year, when it came to harvest time, the atheistic farmer taunted his Christian uh, um, farmer by saying, oh, it looks like God hasn't been very good to you this year. And the atheist, he had no sickness in his family, and he had a bumper crop of, uh, at harvest. And uh, the believer didn't have that. And so the believer simply replied, well, yeah, uh, that may be true. But what you have to remember is that God doesn't always settle his accounts in October, in harvest time. There is coming a day when God will settle the accounts of those that have persecuted his people. And they're not always paid back in the present. In fact, remember there are Psalms and there are Old Testament believers that were really put off and were really, uh, can I say, bent out of shape because they didn't understand how comes the wicked seem to prosper. And uh, all we have is, is difficulties and, and suffer defeats. You know, this isn't right. This isn't fair. This isn't just. 
you always have to remember that there's coming a day when God's going to right all the wrongs. And what he says here in uh, verses 8 through 10 is at the second coming of Jesus the Messiah, he's going to return with his church who had been raptured prior to. He's going to return with his church. He's going to return with his mighty angels. And he is then going to settle the score, so to speak. Now, the chart, if I can uh, have that chart up at this point, I want you to see the difference between uh, the contrast between the rapture versus the second coming, uh, that uh, we can keep this in mind. First of all, in the rapture, Jesus returns in the air. You remember that from 1 Thessalonians 4? In the second coming, Jesus not only comes through the air, but he returns to earth. In fact, the Bible says his feet settle on the Mount of Olives. In the rapture that happens seven years before the, uh, the second coming, he comes secretly for the church. When he comes at his second coming, he comes openly with the church. We know that from Revelation 19. The saints are clothed in in uh, white linen, fine and clean. They come back with him. In the rapture, the church escapes the tribulation. And in the second coming, the world experiences the, the tribulation. Uh, in the rapture, it occurs imminently. That is, there's nothing that has to happen prior to it. It's imminent. It can happen at any moment before we're done here. But the second coming occurs at the end of the tribulation, at the end of that 70th week of Daniel, which is very clearly said to be a seven-year period. All right? So just to keep those two things separate. Thank you. You can put that off now. This is when this judgment in verses 8 to 10 is going to take place. How is it going to happen? Well, notice he says in verse 8, Jesus is going to appear robed in flaming fire, accompanied by powerful angels, and of course, as I said, his church. And when Jesus pays back, when he repays, he pays in kind. And by that, I mean this. You remember when Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, required that all the Hebrew baby boys be thrown into the Nile River to be drowned? Do you remember what happened to that Pharaoh and his entire army at the Red Sea? Repaid. Do you remember also Haman's plot there in the book of Esther? And how he plotted to have Mordecai hung on those gallows that he constructed and to wipe out the Jewish people in the entire Persian kingdom? You remember what happened to Haman and his family? They were hung on the gallows. And then also, can I remind you of Nebuchadnezzar's furnace? Remember those three nice Jewish boys that were cast into that furnace of fire? You remember what happened to the men that cast them in? They perished. But what happened to those three boys? They walked out. You remember also... Uh, King uh, Darius's lion's den. <laughs> Daniel was put in that lion's den. The next day, he was taken out, and the men that accused him, what happened to them? They were thrown in that very lion's den, and the lions weren't nice to them, were they? The Jewish leaders that uh, that had Jesus sacrificed in order to save the city, and the nation, a few years later, guess what happened? The city was destroyed by the Babylonians, and the nation of Israel was dispersed to the four winds of the earth. I say that when God repays, he pays back in kind, and that we see over and over again. Notice it says in the ninth verse that they will be punished See the words there? With everlasting destruction. I want you to understand that, again, as God turns the tables on the wicked, 
their punishment is not temporal like our persecution may be from them. Their punishment is eternal, so much worse. By the way, everlasting destruction, only time that's uh, translated that way in our uh, New Testament. And everlasting destruction, understand this, does not mean they're simply annihilated and they no longer exist. That's not what everlasting destruction means. It refers to an endless conscious ruin an eternal separation from everything that makes life worth living. Notice it says, from the presence of the Lord, they'll be eternally shut out from the face of God. That's what the presence means. They'll be shut out eternally from the, from the face of God, from the, uh, the visible majesty that uh, displays his splendor that will all be off to them, and they will be everlasting punished. And it says that verse, um, if you could drop back to verse 7, here's the third thing that I wanted to show you as to the promises. He tells them you're going to be rewarded, your persecutors are going to be repaid, but I want you now to rest. See what he says in verse 7? To you who are troubled, rest with us. To you who are suffering tribulation, affliction, rest with us. And the word rest there means relief, relax, just relax. It's going to be all right, relax. It actually refers to taking the tension off of a bowstring. You know what a longbow is? You understand? Archery. A long bow. I'm not talking about the compound. Just a long bow. You know, that, that arched bow. When you step on the bottom of it and you pull it to you and you take the string then off of it, all the tension is off that string. It's released. That's what the word rest pictures. That kind of no tension. No tension whatsoever. Um, I think that that phrase in verse 7 at the beginning of that verse is really a, a parenthetical thought. He's, he's telling them, look, um, God's going to take care of you. Don't worry about those that, that uh, trouble you. God's going to pay back. And so why don't you just relax? Why don't you just trust me? That's what he's saying. Uh, Stop living under tension because you're going to be rescued. You know, there's a future hope that we have, not only of being with the Lord, but the possibility is that whatever we suffer, we could be raptured, as I said, at any moment. That's a part of the, the, the uh, hope here. But when Jesus returns to establish his kingdom, we will accompany him, that is the believing church, and all believers will at that moment be made to marvel as they see how Jesus caused them to mirror his image, to mirror himself. And that's what he, he, he says here, that uh, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from uh, heaven with his mighty angels, Drop down to verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and admired in them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. There's coming a day when Jesus comes to, in that second coming, we, we come with him, come back with him to establish his kingdom. He's going to be glorified in us. This is what Jesus does at his second coming with his church. So relax, rest with us. And in the second uh, service in our Bible study, we're going to show you from the scripture, how you actually from the words of Jesus himself, how to relax as a believer. And then there's a, a third thing that he ends this encouragement with in verses 11 and 12. 
And this encouragement is just a prayer that Paul offers for these people. He says in verse 11, Wherefore, also, we pray always for you that God would count you worthy of this calling. The truth that he shares with these people, he says, should motivate them to be faithful in three areas. And the first area that he prays for their faithfulness in is their worthiness. Their worthiness. You know, the reason God gives prophecy like we have here like we will have uh, next week in chapter two. The reason that God gives us prophecy in the Bible is not so that we can satisfy our curiosity, but rather to stimulate us as believers to live up to the calling that he has given to us now and not merely wait for the future. Even under tension to reveal the worthiness of God through our testimonies, under tension, in persecution, in tribulation. So he prays for their faithfulness in the area of their worthiness. But in verse 11, again, we continue. He says, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That is a prayer for their walk with the Lord. He's praying that they would be resolute in their following the Lord, in their will, that they would be empowered by God to obey because they're trusting him. They're relying upon him. And then a third and final area, he prays for their faithfulness that ought to, uh, they ought to be motivated because of the encouragement that God's given them. In verse 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he is praying that they would be faithful not only in their worthiness and in their walk, but in their witness, that Jesus would be glorified when we return with him, yes, but that he would be glorified in our life and with him today, that he would be glorified now in his people, in his church. How? As you take his all-sufficient grace, you reveal the majesty of the glory of God to those that would persecute you, to those that would be against you, to those that would simply be observing you. It's a witness. You know, Christians ought to be people that make the world scratch their heads. I can't figure them out. They take this. They take this and they even prosper when all of this bad stuff that we're trying to do to them is happening. They prosper somehow. We should be head scratchers. You know what? I want to balance this. What uh, Paul says in verses 8 to 10 about the future vengeance that God is going to take on those that persecute the church, those that uh, pick on and hurt believers. You know, we might sit back now and say, yeah, go get them. Yeah. But you know what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44? He said, love your enemies. Oh, really? Love your enemies. He says, bless them that curse you. He says, pray for them that despitefully use you and hurt you and do them good. Is that how you feel toward your enemies? It's one thing I appreciated uh, Grant's um, half tour last week as he brought that in, that with all the enemies that surround Israel, that he's seeking God to keep that balance, that yes, they be dealt with, but at the same time, the enemies are people that need the Lord. And that's how we need to view people that would persecute us, whether it be a family member or, or a co-worker or whoever who would persecute us because we're believers, who would try to hurt us. 
we need to have this balance. Look, God's going to take care of it. Vengeance is his. He says, I will repay. Leave it to him. But do you know how we're supposed to deal with them? If your enemy hungers, what do you do? If he thirsts, what do you do? Instead of being overcome by your enemy's evil against you, you overcome their evil with your good. And you seek to do good to people that do evil to you. And that is supernatural. That you can't do. All you and I can do is hate. The people that do us wrong, we want to hate them. We want to get them. We want to get even with them. We want to hurt them because they hurt us. It's the opposite of what the Christian life is about. And I want to balance that with this. Let God, who does righteous vengeance, let him handle those that have shown you hate or who have hurt you. I was reading recently a book by a, a, a secular author. It's called... Uh, Man's Search for Meaning. It was written uh, by Viktor Frankl, a Jewish man. Between 1942 to 1945, Viktor Frankl, who was a psychiatrist, he labored in four different concentration camps, including Auschwitz, while his parents, his brothers, and his pregnant wife perished in these concentration camps. But in his book, Frankel argues that no human being can avoid suffering. No human being can avoid suffering. But he says this, every human being can choose how we cope with suffering. And he says, you can find, this is a guy that spent time in concentration camps. He said, you can find meaning in suffering. He said, you can move. This is a lost man speaking. You can move forward with renewed purpose. Frankel reasoned that if there is meaning in life at all, then there must be meaning in suffering. He said, because suffering is a permanent part of human life. And without suffering and death, life can't be complete. And so he discovered that prisoners who preferred to just close their eyes and live in the past caused their personal lives to become meaningless. And Frankel concluded that, and I quote, it is a peculiarity of man that he can only live by looking to the future. And this is his, quote, salvation, unquote, in the most difficult moment of his existence. That people suffer. And you can choose how you cope with that suffering. And here's a lost man that says the way that any human being without Christ can cope with suffering is to find future meaning for their life. And so he says, Man can only live by looking to the future. This is his deliverance in the most difficult moments of his existence. What is it that has meaning in your life? What meaning do you have in your life? I'm asking you, what is it that identifies you? Is it your job? Is it your status? Is it your portfolio? What is it that defines you? That's the thing that you have, that you find meaningful in your life. And I submit to you that as believers, we only have one choice in coping with suffering. And we talked about it already this morning. And that is, we find meaning in, in the relationship that we have to the Lord and the future hope that we have, not only for the future in this earthly life, but for eternity. 
If God's going to take vengeance and bring everlasting destruction upon the persecutor, he's going to do the opposite for the persecuted, for his people. He's going to give them everlasting life and blessing. What is the deliverance or the salvation that you are looking to in your most difficult moments, in your most difficult times? What is the deliverance that you look to? Is it your ability to get through it? Is your your ability to somehow manipulate and finagle things where you can survive? It's got to be Jesus. It's got to be him. He's got to be our hope.